John chapter 6. Uh, looking at verse 37, I, we, I made a mention of it that last week that this verse, uh, that this is a verse which should be in our memory bank uh, regarding the assurance of salvation, which provoked uh, some good conversation regarding the assurance of salvation. Because usually when, when we hear that, that phrase, assurance of salvation, Salvation. We think of it in maybe more of the Baptist background or the Calvinist back background where it's once saved, always saved. Um, but you don't often hear about the assurance of salvation, uh, for example, from maybe the Church of Christ or Christian Church background. It's just not something that's really taught, and that's something that's a burden on my heart because it's something that really haunted me until I was probably about 23 years old. Uh, 23 or 24, to where I finally had the assurance of salvation understood because uh, one of Jack Cottrell's books uh, about the doctrine of grace, though very scholarly, which meant I had to wrestle through it because I'm not, um, it actually helped finally register logically what grace was and the doctrine of grace. And from that point, I've been able to actually have that assurance, and it's completely changed my walk with God. But we don't really hear it that often, but that also brought up another text in Hebrews. And so I was looking into that a little bit. So the text in Hebrews is Hebrews chapter 6. Uh, the passage, or the verse at hand that we're, we're considering is verse 4, but we can't read one verse and, and just address it. I think we need to read the entire context. So would somebody be willing to read Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 8? Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting Him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful for those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. All right, so this passage is still well debated within the Christian circle. Uh, it's a passage that I still have to wrestle with. And the reason why is there's an awful lot to cover. That is a very dense piece of Scripture. Uh, but first, the author is writing, and I think this is the importance of context, he's writing to Jews. And he's writing to Jews who were considering um, being Christian, but, all, but then practicing Judaism, which is counterproductive. Okay? They were considering going back to the old way of life and functioning under the old law while trying to still live under the new covenant. That's just, it's just not possible. Uh, verses 3 through 4 uh, kind, of, kind of help us see the, the, the depth of it. But the reason why it's impossible for them to be Christians under the new covenant and live under the old covenant Paul addresses this in Romans. In Romans chapter 8, he says, for, the law, for what the law could not do, weak as it was, through the flesh God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So it's counterproductive to be in Christ and then function as though Christ hasn't come yet. It, it's, it's really, truly counterproductive. Now, one of the things that I've noticed uh, is, is the two common interpretations of this. And so, again, I've wrestled with it. I, pro I lean more towards the first, but it's something I'm still wrestling through. Uh, there's two interpretations. The first is that uh, these were Christians who knew God, received the Holy Spirit, and then left the faith. And that this 
impossible that is being spoken of is because those who were saved and then recanted, they cannot repent because they do not want to repent. Meaning, how can you have the Holy Spirit, taste the grace of God, and walk away? And not only that, walk away and then come back to it. So there's interpretations that it's not that it's impossible in the sense of, because all things are possible to God, but that they are walking away from someone who they had a relationship with, and that relationship is the most meaningful one they will ever have. And so for them to walk away, they're not going to come back. That's, that's one of the interpretations. The other is that these are individuals who had all appearances of being saved, but were not. And I think verses 7 through 8 kind of portray that, where you have ground that soaks up the water and then brings forth fruit, but then you also have ground that soaks up the water, but then only brings forth thorns and thistles. And so two soils both receive water. They brought, both brought, brought growth, but only one growth is one that brought fruit. So, for example, the fruit of the Spirit. Those are evidences of one's conversion and salvation. You know, we're to test the fruit. And so the fruit of the Spirit is that fertile soil, that fruit that's developing in our lives. The other only brought forth thorns and thistles. So one interpretation is that they were saved and walked away, and therefore they won't come back. The other is that they looked like they were saved, but they never really were. There, weren't, there wasn't fruit bearing in their life. So those are the two common uh, interpretations of it. <clears throat> Picking up in verse 38, can somebody please read verse, verse 38 through 39 of John 6? For I've come down from heaven, but not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of all I made a mistake. It's through 40. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise Him up last week. <laughs> now these, these verses are another uh, solid attestation of the triune nature of God. I think this is another good verse that, that helps us to see uh, the very nature of God. As difficult as it is to grasp the Trinity, it still doesn't make it not true. Just because we can't understand how God, who is not bodily, who is spirit, exists eternally, just because we can't understand that doesn't mean that that's not who he is. Uh, we're going to wrestle with the Trinity for some time. The church always has. Uh, but it doesn't change who he is. Whether we understand it or not doesn't change who he is. And so that's one of the things we've got to accept, especially since one of, the, one of the reasons why I struggled with it was I kept trying to visualize God in front of me and how that would look. But in order for me to do that, I was pulling him into really a dimensional space that only I could fathom. And to pull him in means I'm removing a ton of information, a ton of potentiality, and forcing him into this dimensional space when God is not bound by our dimensional space. So already, to do that, I'm removing vital information to try and understand him, which means I'm not seeing him for who he is. I'm, I'm having to remove him to fit him into, I'm trying to make him a square block to fit into the round hole. And, and that's not going to be helpful whatsoever. Verses 40 through 42. Anybody can go for it. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. At this the Jews began to grumble about Him because they said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can He now say, I came down from heaven? Now it would appear that there are those who heard Jesus correctly, but it's very evident that there are still those who are being limited by their hearing and interpreting literally. So we then move forward, and, and I think that many churches should make uh, verse 43 their, their church verse. Jesus answered them, stop complaining among yourselves. That'd be a good church verse. Yeah. 
All right, but, but Jesus is about to say something that we need to spend some time on. So Jesus is, is saying some pretty, what seems like divisive stuff. Some people are taking it inappropriately. Some people are interpreting it literally, and that's causing the division and, and problems within the crowd. And so verse 44, he says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now this is where I differ strongly from the preachers who I, I trust and admire. Uh, the Bible says that none of us will stand before God without excuse, meaning every person will stand before God guilty of not responding to the gospel message. And that also means, yes, even the tribes who have had no contact with other human beings. I firmly believe that God is going to go after them. Now they might be faced with it, and they might do similar to what we saw in Acts, which Paul didn't allow them to, which was they might then go, oh, well, let's just incorporate this God into all the other gods that we, we worship. Or they're going to accept God for who he truly is as the only one true God. Now how that plays out, that's beyond me. Fortunately, I'm not God, and I don't have to figure that out. But there have been quite a bit of conversion experiences where God has done pretty remarkable stuff to attest to who he is. Uh, I've talked about him before, Nabil Qureshi. Um, God went after him through, through his dreams, and he converted to the Christian faith and became an apologist for the Christian faith. He was excommunicated by his own family for being a Christian. I mean, he had every reason to stay, but he refused uh, to, to <laughs> kind of subdue the family pressures and became a Christian. Was he a Muslim? He was, yeah, he was a Muslim. Such a common experience among Muslim conversions, the dreams. And, I mean, it, I'll be honest with you, that's, that's the common experience among many of the occult. It's if you leave, then you lose everything. Well, I mean the dreams, the conversions on the dreams. I don't know if you've ever read much I've heard it. there's quite a bit of, of testimonies with, in the yeah. Middle East of it. Yeah. And, but it, it's kind of it's kind of crazy. Um, I can't tell you his whole story, but it's really interesting how far God went to, to reach him, and he did, and he became an apologist for the Christian faith. And uh, sadly, a couple years ago, he died of, of cancer. Uh, but he was very open about his his treatment, very open about it, and welcomed the Christian community into that. And it was a very very humbling experience. But anywho. So, uh, kind of a, a silly illustration I want us to, to use. Uh, it pulls from the image of, of Christ and the church. You have the groom and the bride. And so this drawing to oneself is, is what we do when we're courting someone. Okay, so when we are pursuing, for example, when I was pursuing Heather, I, I was trying to draw her towards me that she would want to continue a relationship with me. And before she could say no, uh, four months later we were married, so she was already stuck. But it's, it's this drawing to oneself. And so we're attempting to draw someone near to us uh, that we would be committed to one another in a relationship. Uh, but there are those who attempt to draw, and those attempts are rejected. Uh, I don't know about you, uh, but I was filled with a bunch of those. You tried to draw someone in, you tried to impress them, and they wanted nothing to do with you. That's just the part of courtship. You know, that's just the way things happen sometimes. Uh, but, but that's what we're seeing in the drawing of people to God. Many people foolishly reject God's pursuit, but others who we call God's people do not. So God is, is drawing everyone. The problem is, is not everyone is going to respond. Isn't it kind of like Jesus when he said, I knock peace, knocking on the door? Yeah, some people think it's a Jehovah's Witness so they don't open it, but it's really Jesus. <laughs> but you know what? Yeah. That scripture about he knocks and, yeah. and he wants us to open the door. Yeah. 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 Ye
<clears throat> so one, something that's been brought to my attention, which doesn't bother me, and I'm not offended by it, is typically you'll hear me emphasize belief and repentance from the pulpit more than I emphasize baptism. Now the reason why is one, I know with true repentance and, and true belief and repentance, baptism is going to happen. There's no way you can read scripture and think baptism is not essential to the Christian conversion. There's no way you can read baptism and, and not recognize that every single Christian, apart from maybe somebody who's about to die, who was able, believed, repented, and was baptized throughout Christian history. So to read the Bible and to go, oh, baptism's not, not important, I don't, you're not going to land there unless you start skewing things, and you've already got a bigger problem than that. But the reason why I emphasize belief in baptism, and I'll go the other way with it, is if there is a true belief or true repentance, then that's worthless. There's nothing magical about the water. Because if that's the case, we can just start throwing people in water. And there's kind of this, this funny scene in the movie Nacho Libre where they're about to wrestle, and he found out that his wrestling partner wasn't a Christian. And so he comes over with a bowl of water, and he goes, I just thought it might be a good idea. And he just slams his head, and he goes, praise the Lord! And so, you know, if, that, if, if, if there's something magical about the water, then we could just, well, well, they wanted to or not, throw them in. But the same is also true when it comes to some of our other brothers and sisters who will, will do something called the sinner's prayer. This was something that Billy Graham, you know, made popular and so on. But to be honest, even with the sinner's prayer, without true belief or repentance, the sinner's prayer is worthless. Those are just words. And so the reason why I emphasize belief and repentance is because upon these, that I know is going to happen. But without true belief and true repentance, none of it matters. Because it's not a genuine conversion as it is. And so the reason why I emphasize those is, is for that purpose. But you can't read, especially in Acts, you can't read in the book of Acts and, and walk away from that going, ah, baptism wasn't that important. You know, first, first sermon preached at Pentecost, you know, they go, what should we do? And he says, repent and be baptized. Repentance is kind of important to the process. And so that, that's why I, I emphasize that for that reason, is because without true belief and true repentance, then baptism is not going to be any sort of, there's not going to be any, I'm, try, I'm trying to think, um, So I'm getting mixed up with one of my previous statements. With true, with true repentance and baptism, and true belief and repentance, then baptism has a conversional experience. Without true belief and true repentance, then baptism is just a really unproductive bath. And so that's why I'll emphasize those, because again, I know with the first two, then I know they're going to follow suit. One, because that's what our church teaches, but also that's what I'm going to be in their ear about. Because that's one reason why I fell in love with the first Christian church is they don't put it off. I mean, I got saved in the Baptist church, but, you know, it was Christian church doesn't put this stuff off. It's let's do it. And we have no excuse. Here's some clothes. Here's, you have no reason to not do it. There's water. What's preventing me from being baptized, as the, the eunuch said. So... Anyway, I wanted, to, I wanted to talk about that because it is something that has come up. And it's, again, it's not something that's offended me, but I did want to kind of clarify as to why. Uh, verses 48 through 50. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. All right, so now Jesus starts to kind of reveal what he meant, but that doesn't really help because then he takes another hard left turn right after this. But he starts to clarify what he means by the manna, the bread of life, and, and so on, right before he takes another hard left. So he's starting to explain what he meant. The manna in the wilderness was a shadow of Jesus to come. But then 
Jesus, after clarifying this, says something that sounds a little bit too silence of the lambs kind of stuff. <laughs> Can someone please read verse 51 through 58? I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. All right, so if we're in the crowd, can we just be honest? This sounds pretty uh, Hannibal Lectory. <laughs> Uh, it sounds pretty definitive. He's like, literally eat my flesh, right? Uh, so we want to give the audience a little bit of credit here. What Jesus said, if you just jump into it, like if we were to go into a place that 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 had never heard the gospel or who Jesus, and we just give them this verse, how are they going to walk away with it? They're going to be thinking what this crowd thought. Okay, they're going to think what the early early Romans thought. They're cannibals, <laughs> which is an accusation they put against. Uh, Christians, yeah, because of, of communion, exactly. Uh, so everything leading up to this, uh, Jesus has been working uh, in something that's deeper than that. For example, he says manna from heaven. Well, what's he talking about? He's talking about how that was a shadow of him to come. That eating of that bread of him is going to lead to eternal life. And so he's taught, he's working on a level that's far deeper. I am the bread of life, began with the man in heaven during the Exodus, in which the Jews ate. Uh, now, Jesus takes another step and says that his flesh is the bread. Now, this must cause us to ask then, well, what is the deeper meaning? If Jesus is playing on a deeper level here, then, then what does he mean? Where is he at? And so I believe that we see two meanings clearly, and that is at least one part of the Lord's Supper. So we take the Lord's Supper, and we take the, the wafer, and that symbolizes the, the, the body of Christ. And so though, so though verse uh, 35 addresses both the bread with hunger and drink with thirst, uh, which is seen in uh, verses, uh, verse 56, uh, we, we see a, a, a clear at least allusion to the, the Lord's Supper. Um, so with that being established, we can see the second, which is the very nature of salvation. We take communion so that we might remember our salvation, not that we have forgotten, but that we would remember the great sacrifice on our behalf. Now, the reason why I love our communion, and I don't want you watching me, but you'll, you might notice that uh, communion always takes me a while. Uh, it's, it's a time of self-examination, uh, it's a time of repentance, and so um, that's another reason why I fell in love with the Christian church, is doing that every week. Some people would say that, well, doesn't that take away the meaning? Well, yeah, if you're doing it incorrectly, if it's just another check mark to do on Sunday, then yeah, that can lose meaning pretty quick. But if it's a time of self-reflection, of, of examining your previous week, recognizing where you've fallen short, and then finally landing on, but it is the cross of Jesus Christ that has saved me from even this last week, then no, it never loses its meaning. Not, not ever. Um, now there are Sundays where I'm, I'm all over the place, I've got a lot of stuff going on, and for me at least, I feel as though if I take it, I'm going to take it in an unholy manner, because I'm not going to be focused on it, and so I'll, I'll refrain if I'm not going to do it fully focused on God and what He has done, then I believe I'm taking it in an unholy manner. And so I won't do it. But to do it every week, I think, is a very good practice of the church. In fact, the Bible says they, they, they took bread and ate and as often as they met. So that could be multiple times a week. Now, now we're thinking biblically, maybe we're not even doing it right because we don't take communion on Wednesday. But 
I think it's important that the church as an assembly does do it, and I do think every Sunday is a great uh, practice, and I do think that if, if done right, it never ever loses its meaning, especially if you have a real tough week. It, it only amplifies it all the more. So, um, but we take communion so that we might remember our salvation. Um, of course, it's not because we've forgotten. We walked away and forgot we were Christians. It's not that. Um, it's time in which we draw closer to God. We cleave to his word and his promises. Um, Jesus is not speaking literally of eating his flesh and drinking his blood. But the flesh is what destroyed the lamb. Uh, and it is the blood which wash, washes us clean. And so you'll see more of this uh, in the text uh, coming up this Sunday as we look at the ninth and 10th plague. So we have his body which is broken. Then you have his blood which washes us clean. And so Jesus is saying, I am the bread, and you are to eat of me. And so he's beginning to point to the sacrifice that is being made in the flesh. And that's something I'm going to call back to again, because I don't want us to just overlook the flesh aspect. Verses 59 through 60 says, These things he said in the synagogue, and as he taught in Capernaum, so then, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This statement is very unpleasant. Who can listen to it? That seems like such an analytical way to respond. This is unpleasant. But some translations say unpleasant. Others uh, say hard to understand. However, the Greek means this is offensive. So what Jesus was saying to them, they said, this is offensive. Uh, also note that John describes these grumblers as disciples. The question then becomes, but in what way? If the grumblers are considered disciples or called disciples, then in what way were they? Uh, we know that it's clearly not the twelve, but it are, but is the others who are, who are following him. So they've heard the teaching of Jesus, and essentially, they've heard the teaching of Jesus, but they have not accepted Jesus. Okay, to be a disciple was somebody who followed someone. They might have been following him around, and if you look at previously in the chapter, it seems as though they were following him pretty much because they just wanted another meal. But whenever Jesus started teaching some hard stuff, which was really going to divide the crowd, and for some, you know, really put a bullseye on their head, well, that's when they bailed. Now I'm not, I'm not with him. Free food or not, I'm not, I'm not with him. And so it's not the twelve who are departing, it's the, the others who are following as well. And so this is, why, uh, this is why to say, I like Jesus, and then reject what he teaches, it shows that you don't actually accept Jesus. I, I agree with C.S. Lewis. You can't say, I, I like Jesus, uh, I like his teachings. Well, you can't like his teachings. He's either a madman or the Son of God. I mean, I've never met anyone who said they were, the, they were God or the Son of God and not thought, you're nuts. Uh, Jesus doesn't give any room for that. So we can't say, oh, no, I like Jesus' teachings. Well, I, what do we know of his teachings? We know solely because of Scripture. Okay, so you have to open up Scripture. Well, what do the Scriptures say? Script, he doesn't give any leeway. He says, I am God in flesh. The disciples, the, the apostles, testify who Jesus... So this isn't a, I like his teachings. He's either a madman or he's the son of God. There's no in between. So there is no, I like Jesus' teaching, but I don't like Jesus as deity. Well, that's exactly who he said he was. People like his non-contextual platitudes. Do not judge. Yeah, we like to read Matthew 7, 1, neighbor. and that's it. Yeah. They, I mean... Of course, those are universal things. Of course, they're taken out of context with Matthew 7, which, we've, which I did a, a sermon on. Um, so, yeah, we want to take these good rules and, and apply them universally. And, yes, Jesus did say those. But, again, you know, you get to teachings like this, and they say it. You know, this is offensive. Well, Jesus was quite offensive in, in his teaching. He was pretty divisive in the sense that he was finding who was really following and who was just there. And so my, my wife and I had this situation uh, with youth ministry, and she, she still disagrees with my tact. Um, we started seeing our youth ministry grow, 
and we noticed that there were there were plenty of kids there, but it seemed that it was more of a social gathering and not a we're here for this. So it wasn't like I tried to run them off. All I really did was is I just got deeper into lessons. We we just and not like the deeper where we see. I've been I've, I've seen a couple sermons where they're talking about we're going to get deep, and they didn't even scratch the surface of the scripture. They just said controversial things, but that's not deep. You know, you, singling out a sin that is maybe oh you said that from the pulpit. That's not deep. Getting into the text, what it means, where it applies, the culture they're in, and that's getting deep. And so I decided, well, we're just going to go more into the text. And those who want to be here, those who want to learn more about Jesus will stay. And so, sure enough, it went from 35 to 25, and that group was where we then began working through. But, you know, my wife was, was kind of like, don't run them off. And I'm like, I'm, not, I'm running them off with more word? I got nothing for you there. But I get where her heart's at. She's a very tender-hearted, loving person, and I'm kind of like, I'm watching it going I don't want my youth ministry to be a social club. I want it to be a place where we are learning about who God is and, and, and growing closer to Him. Social, I did social stuff with the kids outside of the church. By all means, come over, play WWE on PlayStation 4. Let's, let's hang out. That's no problem. But Wednesday was a distinct purpose. And so I unilaterally made that call. <laughs> and so, you know, but that's, that's where we started moving forward. Um, and, and so, you know, Jesus is saying something that is divisive. He's saying something that's going to weed them out. He's saying something that's going to get rid of the, the, those who are not truly after him. They might be after what he can give them, but he, they're not after him. And that's a big difference. If you can think of any relationship where it's they're, they're around because of what you can give and not because of who you are, you know that that's a shallow relationship. And so he's, he's basically weeding out the shallow relationships. Verse 61, but Jesus, aware of his disciples who were complaining about this, said to them, is this offensive to you? Well, of course it is. I mean, if we were just plopped down into this scene, yes, it sounds pretty offensive. Uh, but something being offensive should not derail our faithfulness to Christ. There was a, a pastor who, who was talking about how people would say, I don't go to church because of the hypocrites. And he goes, the, the thing that stuck with me, he went on a pretty good tirade, which was good, but the thing that stuck with me was the disciples didn't abandon Jesus because of Judas. They, did, he did, they didn't abandon Jesus because of Judas. The church is full of hypocrites. I'm a hypocrite. If anybody can say they're not a hypocrite, then it falls under, you know, what John wrote and saying, he who says that we're without sin is a liar, and boom, that's already a sin right there. So now we're even. The church is going to be full of people who are broken. The beautiful nature of the church is that it allows the liars, the thieves, and, and the swindlers into the fellowship. The downside is, is it allows the liars, the thieves, and swindlers into the fellowship. Those who are regenerate, those who are converted, they no longer become or, or, or continue pursuing being a liar, a thief, or a swindler. But it's those who are non-regenerate, who are here for what God can give them, are here for what the church can give them. Those are the ones who are not being changed in their heart, who are not being transformed by the renewal of their mind. And so the church is an open door to everybody, but not everybody who walks through those doors are after Jesus. And that's something, you know, the elders of the church have, have always had to struggle with because we get a lot of phone calls every week. You know, so there's a lot of things that go with it. Verse 62, what then, if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Let me actually read that previous verse with it. But Jesus, but Jesus, aware of this, of his disciples, were complaining about this, said to them, is this offensive to you? What then, if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? So before Jesus said he, descend, you know, he descended from heaven, referring to his birth, but now he's speaking of ascending, which would take place when? After resurrection. Following the resurrection. So 
He was talking about his dissension, which was his birth, and now he's talking about his ascension, which would follow the crucifixion. But there's even more to this ascending as well. The context of this passage is focused on the body and blood of Jesus. And so with this in mind, we see his being ascended as being ascended even on the cross. So if we... we so if, we, so if the speech of eating his flesh and drinking his blood is so offensive, then what about the crucifixion of the, and death of the Messiah? He's going to be lifted up. This is another, uh, there's another shadow of, of Christ as he speaks of, you'll see the Son of Man lifted up, and he's, he's pointing back to the wilderness yet again where you had the serpent being lifted up, and if they looked upon it, they would be healed. And so... You can say that there's also a, a similarity to his ascending up on the cross, which would be offensive, especially to the Jews. After all, he is speaking in the, the temple. And so for him to talk about the Messiah actually being crucified, well, that would have been very uh, offensive as it was, because after all, they expected a king to return, not the suffering servant. And we talked a little bit about that before. Uh, verse 63, it is the spirit who gives life, the flesh provides no benefit, the words that, have, that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. Now, we can't, uh, we can't, what we can't do is just throw out flesh, okay, to, to just go flesh is bad, it's gone, and, and throw it out. I, I, think that, I think that's throwing out the baby with the bathwater. And so that's not what Jesus is doing here. After all, John 1.1, 1, 1, you know, and the Word became flesh, right? The Word became flesh. He lived in the sinless life in flesh. He died bodily on the cross and raised bodily from the grave. So we can't just throw flesh out as bad and it's not important. Jesus is not saying flesh is useless. Otherwise, what salvation do we have in his flesh? It was in his flesh that he bore the sin of all mankind, thus reconciling us to God. So it's not that flesh has no benefit, flesh, it, it's not, that's not what he's, he's getting at. And so I believe this is yet again uh, another call to uh, the regenerate person. Uh, we know that in John 3, the Holy Spirit plays a key role in our new birth. One cannot be saved by the working of their own flesh. Their flesh cannot earn it. Their flesh cannot bring about life or eternal life in this, in this regard. Your flesh cannot achieve salvation. Our flesh is, is broken. Our flesh is hindered. There's no way we can earn our way into heaven. And so one cannot be saved by the working of their flesh. And so out of flesh is sinful and cannot be the mechanism of our salvation. But the new birth of the spirit, the regeneration of the person's soul, is what saves us. And this is what I believe Jesus is getting at, that the flesh provides no benefit. The flesh is not going to give, give us a place at the table. Our flesh is not going to earn our place in heaven. Isaiah says that even our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. And so our, our righteous deeds are corrupt. Our righteousness is even flawed by its nature. And so our flesh is of no benefit regarding our salvation. But the Spirit, the regeneration of the, the person's soul, the receiving of the Holy Spirit, the seal of our salvation, that is where eternal life is found. And so that's where I think Jesus is going with this uh, in addressing that. He says, the words I've spoken to you are spirit and are life. I find this very interesting because it parallels something that Jeremiah said. The first part of verse 16 of Jeremiah 15, he says, your words were found... Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became joy to me and the delight of my heart. I think that's a pretty interesting parallel. And so as we close, lastly, can I have somebody read 64 through 71? Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to, 
You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is the devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who though, who though one of the twelve was later to betray him. I find what Peter said here very interesting. Uh, notice Peter is not asking what they will do. He didn't say, are y'all going to leave? And, and he, he doesn't say, what will we do? I mean, they can go back to fishing. They're fishermen. They know how to do it. They can just go back to that. He says, to whom shall we go? Peter's proclaiming first that there's no one else that they could follow. There's no one else that they trust that they could follow. And why is that? Verse 69, you are the Holy One of God. He says, who else are we going to... Clearly, they're looking for meaning and purpose and, and, and salvation. And they find that Jesus is the one to fulfill that. And so they say, well, who else are we going to follow? There's no one else. Yeah. May I make a comment on that? Yeah. Did you notice that they, what they did not say? They didn't say we understood what you just said, Lord, about your body and your blood. But they believed him anyway. They believed that he was the Holy One of God and that whatever he said was truth, even though they didn't understand it. And Sometimes, I think that's... And there are things we don't, J.R., mm -hmm. but we have to trust him. Yeah, and I think that there's a lot of things that uh, when we first hear it, certainly as, you know, I wouldn't call them baby Christians because there was no Christians at this time. They were disciples and followers of Christ. But as, as baby Christians, you know, there's things that we heard that we really didn't grasp. But as we matured in the faith, there became more understanding of it and finally came to, to terms with it and understood it. And I think this is certainly one of those that, that they would. Now, I, we can read this, eat my, and we know that he's not really saying eat my body. We, we know, but that's, you know, we're cheating. We have hindsight. We have, you know, their, their divine. Roger Catholic. Yeah. And, and what's, what's, not transubstantiation. Transconfusion, no. Is it transubstantiation? Yes, transubstantiation. No. So the Catholics believe in uh, transubstantiation, that it actually becomes the body and blood of Jesus on, you know, on the way down. And to that I go, I, I kind of wish it was true, because then my prayer for food, you know, Lord, make this broccoli on the way down, would actually work. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so there's, there's things we, we will not grasp, but we will later on. And there, I, I, at least for myself, there's things that I might have had some study into it, but I didn't grasp it until I had an experience with it. And it became clearer with that. So, yeah, I don't think there's, they would be able to listen to this and go, Oh, yeah, I know what Jesus is talking about. Because they were still asking him, so when are you going to establish your kingdom? When are you going to be the king? And that was never what he was going to do. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think even in that, they still recognize, okay, this is something difficult to understand. Maybe even this is offensive. But I know who he is. Therefore, what he's saying, I will wrestle with that as I go. And I think that needs to be our approach to, to things where I may not get it right now, but I'm willing to wrestle with it because I know who he is. I also think that this is something that I feel should be the response of, of any converted Christian. So who else can we follow when we've already come to know Jesus? I can't think of anyone. But this means that any knockoff Jesus or any other faith altogether is it's not him. It's not, it's not following after him. It's, it's, it, Peter goes, whom else shall we follow? And the answer is, well, no one. But to create a new, a, another Christ or to follow another faith, that is saying that there's another way. The problem of that is, and, and we're going to be getting into a series here soon of the, actually I'll be preaching on it uh, Easter Sunday, is Jesus doesn't give us that luxury. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no other way. If we're going to be Christians and we try and you know, profess that we are Christians and we try and give another, another approach to find, then, then no. 
You can't profess Christ and then say that there's another way to Him apart from Him. That makes no sense. And so that, that throws Oprah's theology out the window. But, you know, I think Peter addresses this beautifully. To whom shall we go? And I think for every Christian the answer is no one. There's no one else to go to. There's nowhere else we can turn. This is it. You are, you are the Messiah. And he says, you are the Holy One of God. I mean, give Peter some credit. Yes, he was usually, you know, first to, you know, first to speak or quick to speak, slow to listen. But man, he's dead on here. And so to that, I, I certainly, you know, I certainly give him credit. Any questions? I know we don't really have much time, but any questions, follow up. I appreciate your grace in this because I'm already drained. Being dehydrated takes a lot out of you, so I appreciate your grace in this. Uh, any any follow-up questions? What saved, are we saved, outdoor? I don't think Scripture gives us any, any attestation to that. Uh, but the reason why verse 37 is, is so important for us, we talked about this last week, was Jesus clearly says in this relationship, I'm not going anywhere. And so for the Christian to, to be saved and then to be threatened by losing their salvation, it's not because God's left. It's not because God is, it's because we're, but even then for us to go, I'm afraid, tells us we understand what's at stake. We understand the relationship is at tension. And I would argue that that person isn't unsaved, but they do need to be the prodigal son in return. Now, they could be three steps towards the door, but to recognize that, why, how else are they going to recognize that apart from the Holy Spirit? How else are they going to recognize that this relationship I have with God is, is becoming thinner and thinner without the Holy Spirit calling on? And so I would say, yes, you might very well be heading out the door, but God is still pursuing you, and you're not gone yet. But so many times we think, oh, I've done too much, I've done this, and so they, they just continue out the door for some reason, which makes no theological sense. But God makes it very clear, He's not the one leaving this relationship. He's not the one abandoning us. And so that's why I think verse 37 is a very good verse for our assurance of, of salvation. If, now, if you're like, well, you know, I just don't have anything to do with them. I'm wondering if it's like, yeah, it's probably a good sign. You know, you have nothing to do with somebody who you profess to be the most important figure in your life. Yeah, it kind of doesn't make sense. So, any other any other questions? Yeah, I was just thinking about that. What Peter said there at the end, you know, to whom else would we go? But, you know, nowadays we have a different problem in the church because it's, you know, yes, Christ, you know, Jesus Christ is our Savior, but how many people follow the church or the minister of that church versus yeah. really following Jesus. Yeah, when people kind of ask where you go to church and, and, and then they name drop the pastor, that's a problem. You know, don't ever name drop, first of all, don't ever name drop me. I don't think it's going to be helpful. But, <laughs> but yeah, it's become the celebrity pastor. I go to so-and-so's church. You know, you should be going to the church where the assembly meets and God is present. That's because I don't see, I mean, apart from God working, you know, in the individual's life and his calling, which we've talked about, unless he draws them in, I don't see how anybody at particular churches like Elevation, the only reason God's there is he's trying to draw them out. He's not there to endorse what's going on. So I, I think you're absolutely right. There becomes a celebrity ask. Mm -hmm. Jesus should be the biggest name in our church, hands down. And then there is no second. I don't care how dynamic somebody might be. I don't care how cool something else might be. It's, it's Jesus is the only name that matters here. And if you name drop me, you're already in a bad spot. So, but you're absolutely right. We need, we need to rebuke that kind of celebrity kind of stuff. All right, well, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Uh, I'm going to take off immediately, but you know why. Uh, but let's go ahead and close in prayer. Lord, thank you for this time that we've been able to be in your word. We do ask, Father, that as we continue on uh, getting into John chapter 7, we ask that you would continue to work in us, that we would be able to understand, illuminate your word to us. 
uh, as we come across these passages that those listening uh, in this passage said, uh, these are offensive. Uh, help us, Lord, to wrestle with those. Help us, Lord, to be willing to be offended by things that you say, but while trusting in who you are. We thank you, Father, for your word that you have preserved it uh, over the time, that you have preserved it on the blood of martyrs, that we have it readily available to us here in the United States. I pray, Father, that we don't take that for granted, that we will get into your word and read it and allow your word to envelop our lives, that we would submit to you in all facets, that we would allow your spirit to work in our life, that we would close no door, but allow your spirit to work in us and make us more like Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.